We are ready to start uh, our session. Welcome to the um, Best and Series special, special session. Uh, now we uh, start with the first talk uh, by Carol Raymond, Dawn Exploration of Best and Series. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, so I have a, a lot of material to present this morning, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to go qu quite quickly, but a lot of the um, slides that I'll be going quickly through are simply introducing topics that are going to be covered in greater depth in subsequent talks. So uh, one of my goals is to keep you in your seats for the rest of the afternoon to see all the wonderful results that are going to follow. And I want to start off just um, with a huge uh, shout out to the Dawn team, the flight team, the instrument teams, the operations team, and the science team uh, for making this mission a huge success. So let's get started. Um, this is the 10th anniversary session, and on September 27th is the 10th anniversary of our launch. It was a, a beautiful launch at dawn from um, Kennedy Space Center. And uh, it sent us off on our journey to investigate uh, fundamental questions about formation of the solar system. Um, what were the chemical gradients in the so solar system? Uh, how did the time of the formation of the bodies affect the outcome? And then what processes altered those materials in the protoplanetary disk um, post, or it altered the materials um, after formation? So we have a, a, a schematic here of our journey. Um, we launched and then um, thrusted out to uh, the orbit of Mars where we stopped and fell towards the planet, got a gravity assist, and that kicked us up into the, um, the orbit plane of Vesta where we arrived in July of 2011, spent 14 months, and then uh, left for Ceres. We arrived at Ceres in March of 2015, and we've been there since that period, since that time. We ended the mission, primary mission, in June of 16. We've had a one-year mission extension where we completed um, uh, a new set of science objectives, and we're currently um, planning for the, um, the end of mission activities. We carried three instruments. You're going to hear lots about the data sets in these instruments. The framing camera provided by um, DLR Max Planck and operated by Max Planck. The gamma ray neutron detector built by Los Alamos uh, and operated by uh, Planetary Science Institute. The visible infrared mapping spectrometer contributed by ASI and uh, ENAF and operated for us by the Italian Institute for Space, Astrophysics, and Planetology. Okay, so um, first we'll start with Ceres. Um, the outstanding questions that we're after at Ceres and that we're currently investigating are uh, when and where Ceres formed, whether it harbored a subsurface ocean, um, what is driving the apparent geologic activity on the surface, which I'll be showing you the evidence for, and then whether Ceres is outgassing. And we'll hear more about that at the end of, the, of this uh, morning, this first segment of the special session. Okay, so um, our major finding at Ceres, uh, Ceres is, and, and I'll be going through these um, in subsequent slides, so I don't want to spend time here, but basically we found is partially differentiated um, but it lacks an ice-dominated outer shell. There's a bit of a, um, a contradiction. Um, while it's dark, it has very bright areas. I know you all know that by now. Um, and the bright areas are generally bluer in slope. The surface is covered with altered material. Um, magnesium, serpentine, ammoniated phyllosilicates, and sodium carbonates associated with, the, with that brightest material. Um, the geomorphologic and compositional data are pointing us to, towards recent geologic activity, and we found organics locally on the surface. Um, also, Ceres' exosphere appears to be linked to solar energetic particle bombardment. There we go. Um, so Ceres in color is beautiful, enhanced color map as a result of the framing camera filter data, and um, Andreas is going to be talking about this in, uh, in depth in the next talk, but as I said, the brighter material appears to have, I'm not going to do that again, okay. uh, appears to um, be located in areas that have a bluer slope, and the, um, the 
There is um, also the reddest material um, up here, doesn't stand out too much on this map, is associated with the local organics deposit. Now, the surface composition is, composition is remarkably homogeneous. And so this is a 2.7 band center map, and as you can see, it, it varies little over the surface. Um, the the 2.7 and 3.1 micron map show us that the surface is uh, covered with the ammoniated phyllosilicates, and these indicate a global phase of aqueous alteration. So uh, given the alteration and the presence of ammonia, uh, this begs the question of where series formed. And previously, there was a, a hypothesis series formed in the trans-Neptunian disk because it looks kind of like Kuiper Belt objects, and then it was transported. But this, this has some problems because it's dynamically difficult, and series does not resemble TNOs or KBOs. So uh, series may have formed closer to where it is now of material that drifted in or was scattered in um, while it was accreting. Um, but this also has problems because uh, there, the hypervolatiles would be lost when crossing the Jupiter gap. So an emerging paradigm is that series formed between the orbits of the giant planets and then was scattered inward during uh, the giant planet growth and migration. And this is a, a subject of ongoing um, investigation. Now, uh, Don measured the topography of Ceres very accurately to um, a 20 meter height accuracy at, at about 100 meter spatial resolution. And we found that it has a very rough surface, not the smooth, icy surface we might have expected. Um, and we also um, used that data and the gravity data to then uh, determine that the interior of Ceres appears, well, the, the um, immediate crust of Ceres appears to be quite strong because it's supporting the topography of the craters. Um, it has a, a fairly low density and therefore cannot be composed of um, high, a, a lot of silicates. So it appears that the strong phases in the crust are um, clathrate hydrates and salts. Um, below this stronger mechanical layer is a dense weak layer, which we think uh, is controlled whose um, rheology is likely controlled by a small percentage of brines in the pore space. And then deeper inside, there's an interior of hydrated silicate, and there could possibly be a dehydrated center, but we can't, um, we can't see that from the gravity data alone. Okay, so um, Tom Prettyman will be talking much more about the grand data. Two points here. Um, we see a, a shallow ice table. Um, near the surface at the poles and receding at the equator. And this ice-free regolith um, here shows a composition similar to altered um, chondrite, CICM composition, whereas the iron abundances are lower than the average values you would see in the CICMs. And this, so this would be consistent with um, sinking of these iron particles um, in a, a global ocean. So altogether, these um, observations give us a picture that um, there likely was a, uh, there was a, a subsurface reservoir. It may have been uh, an ocean. It may have been a, a very muddy, saturated layer. Um, and that's the, the evidence being the partial differentiation, the extensive water rock fractionation, volatile mobility, and uh, the aqueous alteration and transport to the surface shown by the, um, the phyllosilicates. So we can check the box on uh, presence of a subsurface ocean. Now, um, we also uh, got a lot of information about the recent geolog geologic activity from um, some specific features on the surface. The Akator crater showing um, the central peak, which appears to have, um, the, the dome appears to be um, quite young compared to the overall crater and may be the result of recurring uh, cryovolcanic eruptions. And thus, this will be talked about later as well. Um, and in, in addition, the sodium carbonates, as I said, are located in those bright spots, and they're most um, concentrated here in the center of Akator Crater. Um, and this composition of sodium carbonate and ammonium salts is similar to what we see in hydrothermal deposits on the Earth as well as what's coming out of the plumes of Enceladus. And these are the only other places in the solar system we find materials of this composition. So this makes um, Ceres a very 
chemically evolved body and ex an extremely interesting um, in terms of processes. As well, Hunamans, um, a singular mountain on the surface, um, appears to require some uh, few percent of brines in the subsurface that uh, cause the eruption of this feature. And these bright streaks that are coming down the sides um, are also rich in sodium carbonate. So clearly we have um, sodium carbonate in the, the deeper subsurface, and when there's a, a process which is mobilizing that material and is coming to the surface in features like this um, construction of Ahunamans as well as um, these bright spots in impact basins. So I'm going to switch gears here. Uh, lastly, the exosphere of Ceres, which was um, observed by Herschel Space Observatory before Dawn got to Ceres and by several other ground-based assets, um, was associated with perhaps a cometary type um, activity on Ceres. What what uh, Dawn found was, with the gamma-ray neutron detector, that there were electrons being reflected off of a transient atmosphere on two occasions. So this was uh, specific events, not ongoing activity. And that um, electron event, seen by Grant in these four MeV protons, correlated to an event recorded on the, um, with the wind spacecraft in the same energy range, but 10 hours earlier. So at 1 AU, this event was passing the Earth. I mean, at that time, the event was passing the Earth. And then it reached Ceres, and it caused this, um, this transient atmosphere to form. So uh, Mickey Villarreal went back and um, then looked for all of the times when there were detections um, from ground and space-based assets of water vapor at Ceres at what the solar um, Envir electron solar energetic particle uh, flux was in the vicinity of Ceres and found a, uh, a very strong correlation between uh, this positive flux of, or enhanced flux of two, uh, greater than two MeV solar protons and these water vapor detection events. So we believe that this is a, a pretty good hypothesis to be tested in the future. Um, so I went over these points. I'm going to um, get to, Ve to Vesta now. But we have Ceres forming very early with abundant ice and other volatiles. And um, it then differentiated, went through extensive aqueous alteration. The ocean froze from the top down, incorporating some uh, fines. And then it was, uh, the crust was mixed up by impact and also um, most of the ice sublimated away, leaving this um, silt, uh, silicate salt and clathrate hydrate rich, strong crust that we're seeing. Um, and we also uh, see evidence for recent activity driven by brines. So I'll move on quickly to Vesta. Um, before dawn, we knew a lot about Vesta from the HED meteorites. Um, and they indicated that Vesta had differentiated, had an iron core and a basaltic crust. And we confirmed this paradigm by matching both the bulk spectral properties and the uh, elemental abundances to the HED data. So here's the, the VIR uh, data in the band one, the one micron, two micron band centers, and um, also shown our measurements of HED meteorites. Um, in addition, the grand elemental uh, ratios uh, are plotted here in these ellipses, and here is the meteorite data. So we had a very nice um, confirmation there of HED type material across the surface. And in fact, most of it appears to be um, Howardite in Howarditic in composition. Um, also, the gravity and shape data told us that there is, uh, it is consistent with a, metal a metallic core, and the size of that core is also consistent with the metallic element depletions in the HEDs. Um, so geochemical modeling could be attempted constrained by these data, in particular the, the average core density radius um, family of solutions. And so it, it was found that the Vesta was consistent with a sodium poor H chondrite cons composition with uh, a minor CM chondrite composition. All of these other compositions were ruled out. And then uh, further thermal chemical evolution modeling said that Vesta formed within 1.5 million years after CAI. So we got um, a good um, handle on the initial composition and the timing of formation. Um, 
we, we found these two giant impact basins at the South Pole. They had excavated very deep into the interior um, and, and likely released most of the material on Earth um, in the HED collection. But what we didn't find was olivine in these deep basins, and that was some of a, somewhat of a conundrum. Um, that's another one that takes three clicks. Um, but what we, we also found was that there's a lot of lithologic diversity on the surface. So we have, um, at, even at local scale, we have a lot of variability, but here we have regional variability where we have an area which is very diogenite rich in um, the grand data, in VIR data, and the framing camera color data. Um, and these, um, the also occurring in this sector is the um, specific outcrops of olivine, and there are uh, density variations here, which are supporting an interpretation of late stage emplacement of plutons um, derived from uh, intracrustal um, magmas that are uh, like, likely the cause of these regional um, chemical variations. Also, we found hydrogen on the surface of Vesta that appears to have come from impacting carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, both in the, the grand hydrogen uh, element abundance data and also um, in the VIR from the OH band. So uh, the, there are geolo also geologic evidence of volatiles on the surface of Vesta in several young impact craters. This is Marcha Crater, which has um, these, uh, sorry, um, has these, these dark, uh, deposits outcropping in the in the rims of the crater walls has uh, pits in the center and a lot of evidence for fluidized ejecta. Um, this is a close up of the pits in the Marcia crater floor, and they're similar to ones uh, seen on Mars associated with volatile release. Um, in the craters that have the pits, like Marcia and uh, Cornelia, um, you also see networks of dendritic gullies. And these also are similar to those seen on Mars and Earth, um, and imply that there was water flowing on Vesta for a short period of time. And this was a really um, surprising result. So um, it begs the question whether there is at present any buried ice on Vesta, and whether it, it was delivered by water-rich impactors like Ceres, um, and that maybe these types of um, uh, bodies also delivered the water to Earth at the same time. So uh, further research is ongoing into this hypothesis. Um, and then this is just a summary of what I've just said. Important points, early formation, volatile depleted, depleted chondritic material, um, differentiation, formation of a large iron core, a complex magmatic evolution, and a compositionally stratified mantle, uh, which left the olivine sequestered deep inside the body. Um, the hydrated material implies that de the delivery of volatiles to the inner solar system by primitive asteroids was probably an important process. And while we confirmed the basic HED paradigm, we learned that differenti differentiation on a small planet like Vesta is quite complex and involves uh, also, and, and we also determined that this radial mixing of solar system materials um, appears to have been quite robust in this period. So to summarize, um, Vesta is the parent body of the HEDs. It formed early, I said all that. Um, Ceres formed later, but not much, because it also had to incorporate some aluminum-26, formed from volatile rich material, partially differentiated, underwent global aqueous alteration, and appears to have brine-driven geologic activity, um, possibly to the present. Um, and then the radial mixing in the protoplanetary disk is evidenced in the history of these two uh, quite different sibling protoplanets. Thank you for your attention, and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you, Carol. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, and we have to move on.